Good morning, church, and welcome to the English service at Chinese Baptist Church of Coral Springs. We are so glad that you joined us this morning. We also want to welcome those of you that might be viewing this back at another point in time later this week. We want to say hello to you guys as well. Um, in any case, it's a special Sunday for us. Yeah, first Sunday of August. So for some of you, that means that the school year is starting back up. I know I personally have to go back to work on Tuesday. Feels like it went by super duper fast, but uh, we're looking forward to this year together because so many great things that I know that God has in store for us. So would you ready your heart for worship with us this morning? Almighty God, the Lord from everlasting to everlasting, creator of both heaven and earth, the great I am, who is the Alpha and the Omega. Lord, you are the reason that we meet this very morning to worship you and to declare your majesty and to ascribe to you glory and honor and all praise. Lord, for to you belong all things and you hold all things within the very palm of your hand. And so, Father God, we humbly ask that you would meet us this morning as we worship you in song and as we worship you through the reading of your word and through hearing your word be spoken to us, God. We ask that your Holy Spirit would be upon us, that we could have eyes to see and ears to hear. And God, that we would respond to your word as all of creation has done throughout history. God, I pray that our hearts would not be so hard that we could not receive from you this morning. And Lord, I pray that you would stir in our hearts and stir in our, each of our lives and our different situations, God, how we can continue to honor you and glorify you through all that we do, God. For you are not just a God of knowledge, but you are a God that is active and living and moving. And so, Father God, we just pray that you would send us as your laborers into the harvest. And God, we commit to you our upcoming year. We commit to you the start of the school year. We commit to you all of these things that could stress us and cause anxiety for us, Lord. We submit to you humbly, Lord, all of our requests regarding the struggles around this world, within our country, and within our city. Father God, and we pray all these things knowing full well that you alone are the Lord who is omnipotent, who is omniscient, and is able to do all things and bring all things to completion. We pray all these things in your precious and in your holy name. Amen. Would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? I invite you to read this out loud with us. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 115, verses 1 through 3, verse 18. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. For the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness, why should the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. But we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. with your mouth. You ready? Sing this with me. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. And great So we pour out our praise. 
praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you.
the Spirit was moving. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come restore us. Come restore us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come restore us. Come restore us. When you feel the room, come rest on us, come rest on us, come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you feel the room, come rest on us, come rest on us. like in the upper room. Fire and wind come to it again. Open up the gates, let heaven on in. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Fire and wind come and do it again. Open up the gates, let heaven on in. Come rest on us. Come rest on Restore in us, you're all we want, and 
Some of you guys have been participating in our community groups um, this past season of going through 1 Corinthians. Um, one of the things that the leadership team was kind of talking about together is the necessity for us to continue to grow and to continue to go. And so as this um, new school year begins, I just want to encourage those of you guys that are in school I want to encourage those of you guys that even if you're working, you can kind of follow along with this calendar of being in school. Uh, but to consider how might the Lord be calling you to move? How might he be calling you to reach those that are around you? Whether they're your coworkers, whether they're your neighbors, or your friends. Who are the people that God has placed on your heart? at the end of the day our faith as James puts it is, is dead without works and not to say that we're emphasizing this idea of doing things to earn salvation but the whole point that we sing and we ask for the Holy Spirit to meet us is so that we might be empowered to share the gospel truth with those around us so there is this aspect of going and one of the best ways to grow is through going and so as we sing this next song I just want you to consider what, what areas, what places might God be putting in your heart, where is he calling you to, to participate in maybe for some of you it's you feel called to work with youth maybe some of you feel like you need to volunteer in the community whether that be through like a soup kitchen or through like an orphanage. But I want to encourage you to, to consider where God might be leading you. Because it's when we're active and we're responding to his word, that's when we grow the most. Bible study can only take us so far. And so as we move into this next season, I want you to consider how might you consider, how might you start to move so that your faith is not just compartmentalized from the rest of your life. Would you sing with me? Should nothing of our ever stand, no legacy survive, unless the Lord does raise the house in vain its builders strive to you who boast tomorrow's gain tell me what is your life amen that vanishes at dawn all glory be to Christ lift this up all glory be to Christ our King all glory be to Christ i 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for our morning together in corporate singing. We declare all glory be to Christ, for it is you who give us breath in our lungs, for you sustain us according to your purpose and will. We thank you for your grace and mercy. Lord, we can't wait for that day when every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And while you give us breath on this earth, we want to proclaim. We want to live that truth that all glory be to Christ because he is our Lord and Savior. He is the faithful one. 
full of compassion, steadfast love abounds forever to those who seek and love him. Father, we thank you for the preciousness of your word. We ask as we now approach to hearing your word that you would give us ears to hear, minds to understand, and hearts to obey. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This morning's message is a continuation of our series in 1 Corinthians. I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians 10, 7 through 14. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents nor grumble, as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction, on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed, lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape, that you may be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. This morning's sermon is titled, Flee from Idolatry. Good morning, church. Nice and loud. Um, okay. Uh, thank you, Deacon Cam, for the reading of God's word, and also thank you so much, Brian, for leading us in a heart of worship. So I also just want to say thank you to all of, uh, all of you guys, the church, the parents, uh, the families, the students, for your prayers and support for our youth retreat this past weekend. And it's like a blur. It, um, it happened really quickly. I, uh, I'm, I'm very honored and very blessed to be able to lead and to bring the students to Sebring um, and really had that weekend to retreat and to spend time in fellowship and with the parents who sacrificed their well-being and their sanity in, in coming with the students and, and their support. I thank you guys so, so much for that. And that is something that I hope that as a church body we would as Brian said earlier, you know, as a community, not just to me for, you know, just for a Bible study, which is important, but to do things beyond our comfort and to do things that would help us go out there and to grow and to do more for the kingdom of God. So thank you again, church. Um, you know, it wasn't as intense as Fuge, which I'm very happy for. I'm very thankful for. <laughs> and uh, the great news is, yeah. Um, you know, as per tradition, for most of these retreats, I usually come back super sick and go see the doctor. But praise be to God, I am very still, I'm very much alive and healthy. So, so as we continue our series in First Corinthians, <clears throat> um, the title is "Flee from Idolatry," and there's a key verse that I want to emphasize, a key and very important and crucial verse in God's Word. In 1 Corinthians 10, 12, where Paul says and instructs the church, Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. And you know, this verse, um, 
it is in the English Standard Version, and sometimes when I think of this verse, they, they include a lot of words that are very old-fashioned, right? <laughs> it's very, it's very old English sounding, right? Who, who, who goes around and say, hey, take heed lest he fall, right? No one actually goes around and says that in a normal vernacular. So what exactly then does this phrase mean? What is Paul saying when he's talking about idolatry uh, to a church who, let's face it, has a big problem with idol worship, right? And basically, ultimately, what it would translate to simply is to be careful. To be careful as you are tempted into the opportunity or possibility of falling into idol worship. You know, we talk a lot about what idols are at church. And idols are basically anything, anything that you would desire, love, and worship more than God. There is God, and there is literally anything else that you would put your heart, body, mind, and soul into above God, and that would be an idol. And the instruction of Paul to this church and my hope and my instruction to you, this church, would be to be careful, to be careful of that, to not fall into the temptation to worship anything above our Lord. So, of course, the big question then is, well, how do we be careful? How do we be careful that we don't stand above so high up that that we're in danger of falling into idol worship? And as we look at this passage, there's, there's a few things I think Paul is reminding the church of how to be careful and not fall into the temptation of idol worship. The first thing would be to have community, right? something that we emphasize a lot, especially in our English ministry, to have community with one another, to be together as a church body, as a fellowship, as a group of people, as the people of God. In 1 Corinthians 10, starting in verse 1, Paul tells the story of the Israelites, God's chosen people in the Old Testament. And he tells the Corinth church, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. All of them, God's chosen people, the Israelites, all of them did all of these things together, that they were all trapped in sin and slavery in Egypt, and all of them were rescued by God, that they were delivered and they crossed the Red Sea, and they are on their way, all of them, to the Promised Land. And in the desert, all of them were provided with food and drink, all right? Spiritual manna from heaven, bread from heaven, and water from a Literally, from literally a rock, right? A rock that Moses struck when they were all thirsty and water came out for them to drink. All of them shared in this together. And is this not a story of how, what a church should also be in the early church in the book of Acts? They drew, they, sorry, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of the bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And when you take a group of people who've undergone, underwent so many trials and experiences and witnessed all the amazing things that God has done for them, whether it was Old Testament, the miracles of God, or the miracles of the Spirit in the New Testament, all of them shared in this experience and had this community with one another. And they could not, for a time being, could not be distracted or fell into the temptation to worship anything but God. 
that all of them were able to worship God so wholeheartedly because they had the same mind, the same unity, that they continued to meet together and share these things. And that is why it is such an important reminder, as it says in Hebrews, right, to consider how to stir up one another to love and good works not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more, as you see the day drawing near. And I remember this verse we emphasize so, so much, actually, a lot, especially the past few years, right? And I would implore the church to emphasize this verse again, especially as we take a break from the community group. It, it shouldn't default into thinking, Hooray! I have until September to do whatever I want. I mean, that, yeah, that, that would be, that's true. You could do whatever you want Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday, whenever your normal community groups uh, used to meet. And have a break. Enjoy this time. Enjoy this time to have a retreat, right? But don't neglect to still meet together. Don't make it a habit, right? Don't make it into a form of worship, right? That you would love to neglect meeting with one another over your desire to be together and worship God together. The community helps us to not only be together, but to focus on our worship to the one true God. I don't know about you, but it's a lot easier to worship God with one another than <laughs> it is to worship God on my own. I got to say, I feel, I, you know, I'll be honest, right? I feel the most connected with God here on Sunday with all of you guys. And I'll be honest, right? Monday morning, I'm kind of brain dead. And I'm not the most in tune with the Lord, probably because I'm just catching up on sleep and trying to enjoy the day off. But to be with the church whether in service or community groups or just whether in fellowship or with dinner or with an event or an activity or with service together. Why, why would there be anything else worth worshiping but a God that brings us all together? So, so do not neglect to meet with one another. And don't forget your worship towards God. Unfortunately, in the Old Testament, as many of us know, it didn't really work out so well with them, right? They were together, and they saw all these things, and they experienced all these things. But nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. And so not only is having that community helpful and important in being careful not to fall into idol worship, but there's something else that is necessary, right? More than just a group of people, but to also have experience. If you have experience, you're able to learn and not fall into the temptation to worship anything else but God. To have experience that you can recount from the past or to learn from the experience of others. And now these things, the things that the Israelites in the Old Testament went through, it took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. What did they desire exactly? And so Paul tells them, don't be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and then rose up to play. You know what they desired? You know what they loved more than God? Entertaining themselves. <laughs> that their object of worship was their comfort and how happy they could be as long as they were satisfied. That, hey, it's great that God is giving us this free food and drink, but this is so much better than who God is. And that was their mentality, and that's what made them idolaters, that they worshipped their desire to eat, and to drink, and to play all day, right? Their own personal self-gratification. We must not indulge in sexual immorality, as some of them did. 
So another object of worship, sex. Their own perverse version of what they thought sex was. Not the one that was designed by what, and what God intended for them. But something that, again, they would gratify and satisfy for themselves. No matter how perverted or how wrong or, or moral it was. Because they indulged in it. And they sought after it more than what God could provide. And what God said, hey, this is what sex is meant to be. And as their punishment, 23,000 fell in a single day. And we must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble, as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. You know what else these group of people, this community, loved more than God? They loved complaining about God. <laughs> they loved complaining about how God was just not enough. Or how God, you know what, if God really loved us, if God was really real and true, he would do these things. You know what, let's put him to the test. If, if God doesn't give me this, then I'm not going to worship him. If God doesn't provide me this, then I won't believe in him. If God, if you're there, give me a sign and make it, under my own conditions. And that is a real form of idol worship, right? That you would love to test the Lord more than trust in the Lord. And this was a group of people who would do these things, that they would say to themselves, man, this God that delivered us out of slavery and shown us miracle after miracle and provided for us, you know what? It's not enough. And as a result, God punished them for their insurrection and their disobedience and their complaining and worshiping things more than God. And so now these things happen to them as an example for us. But they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. In Romans, Paul, uh, the writer of Romans emphasizes as well, for whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So to have experience helps us to know, hey, maybe we shouldn't fall into idol worship because let me ask you this. Has there, any, has there really been anything that you've experienced for yourself that you thought was more than God and you realized it just came up really empty. I, and it could be anything. It could be self-gratification, some, some sport of, form of entertainment, right? Something that you thought was so fun, nothing could be better than this. And then the more you pursued it, the more you realize, wait, this isn't really quite cutting it. Or maybe it could be sex. Or it could be complaining. <laughs> or just being, just being angry or not satisfied with anything, right? That you would desire to find fault in everything besides find acknowledgement and thanks and appreciation for who God is. And all of these things, whatever you've gone through, whatever experience you've had, you must have realized, yeah, this is not quite enough no matter how much time and effort and energy and money and focus that I spent on it, it's just, it's just not quite enough. To learn from those experiences and to realize, yeah, this, this is not something worthy of worship at all. And so therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest you fall, right? Be careful that you would put yourself in this place where you think, yeah, this is more than I need. This is everything I need. Be careful, because that is when you will fall into idolatry. Experience is something else that helps us flee from idolatry. But there's also one more thing as well that comes with experience. That is part of the experience, right? And that's to have trials. 
to go through the difficult times, right? To go through these tests that God puts you in on purpose, on purpose. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way out of escape that you may be able to endure it. You know, I'm fairly certain every time I've been tempted by something, in hindsight, in in thinking back, there is a way out. Right, there's always two options. It's, there's always two options, no exceptions. Option one, fall into the temptation, right? Give in to sin. Usually that's the easier option, let's be real. I mean, let's be honest. You just fall into temptation because you think it might feel good at the time or you think there's nothing else that could satisfy you or you think you have no choice. That's option one. Option two, Turn the other way. Run from it. Get away from it. Do anything else but fall into that temptation. Right? Those moments of weakness that you find yourself in, pick yourself up and get out of there. And God has put you in that situation to see what you will choose. God has designed you to have that trial to see if you can endure it. And I don't know about you, but I think God knows what he's doing. You know who doesn't know what they're doing half the time? Most of the time? Almost all the time. <laughs> Me. You. We don't really know what we're doing. And so when we're faced with that temptation, can we really trust ourselves? No. <laughs> we need to trust in the Lord, right? We should be thankful for those trials to learn from, to have those experiences. Because all these temptations to worship anything else but God, God has provided a way out. Now, you might honestly ask yourself, why would God put me through that, right? If God really loved me so much, he would just not let me go through those kind of things. I think that's a very immature and wrong way to think about it. I think if God really did love you, he would see if you could go through those things, right? Right? God would not baby someone and just cover them and protect them from all the harm and difficulties in the world because that's not realistic at all, right? They wouldn't, God wouldn't shelter anyone and say, yeah, don't worry about anything. You just have to blindly follow me and you'll never have to test your faith at all. That's not realistic. You know, I think part of my role as, as someone called into ministry is to kind of purposely put students and people into a situation where they kind of have to choose, right? <laughs> because I, I think of myself when I had to choose as well. Uh, there's definitely a lot of times that I didn't choose wisely and I didn't choose correctly and I didn't choose God. But when I finally accepted Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior, when I realized what Jesus has done for me through all the different trials that I've been in. God, I am so thankful that I can choose him. And I feel that it's more real than just growing up and blindly just choosing God because everyone else told me to. I made that choice for myself. But God provided me those opportunities to make those choices too. So have these trials, right? And when you face those trials, beloved, flee from idolatry. Run from it. Choose God, right? Don't choose those idols. Don't choose anything else. The cup of blessing that we bless is it not a participation in the blood of Christ. The bread that we break is it not a participation in the body of Christ. And so Paul is referring to communion, the Lord's Supper. And as a community where we have communion together, where we share in the Lord's Supper, what are we sharing? We're not sharing these little cups of grape juice and this tiny, uh, what do you even call them, right? Crackers, I guess, or like morsels of, of dried bread or dough. Well, it's, not, it's, not, it's not about 
those things, right? It's, it's about what communion represents and what we remember, what Jesus did. And so we are sharing in that. We share it as a community and to have that experience and to remember the trials that Jesus went through for each and every one of us. The trial that he died at the cross, that he broke his body, that he bled out his blood for each and every one of us. And Paul recounts his own background, right? Everything that he was proud of and accomplished, all the idols that he had in the past, as he shares his testimony in a letter to a different church, the Church of Philippi. In Philippians, he, he tells them about all the accomplishments that he had. Success, money, power, authority, status. A Pharisee, a Jew among the Jews, right? Smarter than anyone else, young, and just possibilities abound in the temple. He could have anything he wanted. And then he had the choice to choose Jesus. And he realized, I counted everything, all those things that he worshipped, all those things that he loved and was proud of, and that he desired. I counted everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as trash, garbage, Rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, and that I might know him, may know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share in his sufferings, to share in those trials that Jesus went through, becoming like him in his death. And then by any means possible, I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. That Paul would give up everything he desired and worship above God, and he would choose to share in the sufferings and trials that Jesus went through. And that is what communion, that is what the Lord's rep- Supper represent. That we Remember the trials our Savior went through us, and we share in those things too. And so because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Are they are they not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? And so if you recall... Paul was talking about, you know, food being offered to idols. You guys remember that that passage where, hey, is it okay if we eat meat that was offered to idols? You know, some people are saying it's okay. Some people are not saying it's okay. I think it's free food. Some people think it's tainted with demon possession, right, because it's for idols. It's for fake gods. And so what, what is Paul saying? What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? Uh, no. No, I imply that pay, what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. Now, here's something very interesting, right? That if you don't have a relationship with God, I mean, you're basically considered a pagan. I mean, we were all pagans. We were all sinners, right? Because we all did not have a relationship with God at one point. And what they are sacrificing, what they are giving up for, to worship instead of God, well, Paul's making the claim that it's a form of spiritual worship and you're worshiping demons, right? You're worshiping anything but God. It's a very metaphysical, spiritual concept. But what Paul is saying is, yeah, if you don't have a relationship with God, anything you offer that's not God is ungodly, right? It's demonic, 
It's antichrist, basically. That's basically what it means. And Paul, and I would encourage you to not be participants with that. Right? That instead of worshiping and sacrificing your well-being for anything but God, you would worship and sacrifice for God instead. And that's the reality. You can't serve both things. That, that logically and cannot make sense. You cannot sacrifice one thing for God and then sacrifice another thing that is not God or that is demonic. You can't drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You can't partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? And our God is a jealous God. You know, people, I, I remember people don't like to hear that. Right? They don't like this idea that God is a jealous God. Why? Because jealousy as a human trait is bad. Jealousy as a human trait is usually frowned upon. But let me, let, me, let, me, uh, let me try to challenge you with this. If you're in a relationship, dating, married, um, someone really close to you, I guess, in a, rom- a, a very romantic way, let's just say it like that, wouldn't you want your partner to be jealous? Right? Do you really want your partner to... Do you want to say to people... Yeah, my wife, my husband, they don't care if I talk to other people in a very romantic and non-platonic way. Right? Like you're married to someone, right? You, do you think it's wise for a husband to go around and telling people, yeah, I can talk to other women, no problem. My wife doesn't get jealous at all. That's a red flag. You know why? Because your wife is probably, <laughs> your wife is probably uh, talking to other people too, I guess. Right? Same thing with with wives, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, my husband lets me talk to other men. No problem. He doesn't get jealous at all. No, man, you should be jealous. And you should hold fast to your wife and you should protect your wife from all those other, let's face it, scoundrels, right? So, same thing with students. If you're dating, don't you want your boyfriend, girlfriend to be jealous? You think it's cool and modern and <laughs> like progressive that you're so open? I, I'll tell you now, that's not really realistic, and that's probably a problem. It's most likely a problem if your partner doesn't get jealous. So if God is not a jealous God, let's say if God is just saying, hey, yeah, it's okay, you can worship me, you can worship these demons, no problem, right? I think that is a huge problem. That would be a huge problem to our faith. So why should we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Why should we say, those who are in a relationship with God, Now, you know, I'm going to talk to these other things. I'm going to focus my time and my energy and my worship towards anything but you, God. Is that okay? No, that's not okay. God is a jealous God, and the repercussions of a jealous God is quite serious. Right? In the Old Testament, you shall not bow down to them or serve them, other gods, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, that they will suffer generation upon generation. They will suffer the wrath of God if you dare worship anyone else but God. For I, the Lord your God, in your midst is a jealous God, lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you, and he destroy you from the face of the earth. You see, the consequence of idol worship is destruction, (laughs) right? It is not just a separation from God. It is obliviation. It is complete annihilation. You are wiped out if you worship anything but God. And that is a scary thought. And you might think, well, why would I worship God? Because the opposite would be true, too. Right? God has promised eternal life, resurrection, not complete disappearance from the face of the earth, but to have a joy and eternal life with God the Father and with the people of God to not have to fear nothing, 
but to look forward to everything. So yeah, God is a jealous God, and honestly, that's a good thing. But the reality is we can't worship two different things. We cannot worship God, and we can't worship not God. (laughs) We can't have idols. No one, as what Jesus says, can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And Jesus is using money as one example of idolatry. But it could be anything, right? It could literally be anything that you put above God. So, church, as a community, as a body of Christ, as we share in these experiences and as we go through trials together, I hope right, that we would remember ultimately we can't serve ourselves, right? We can't serve other things more than God. We should encourage and remind each other and help each other to grow, to devote our worship towards the Lord. You know, today marks a very special day. Those who are watching online, surprise, you are not watching this live. I know this for a fact, right? That none of you are watching this Sunday morning from the comfort of your office or living room or computer. Um, you know it would be awkward? Let me, is that a thumbs up? Is that true? That's true, right? <laughs> okay, so, yeah, so surprise. Uh, you are watching this not in real time. And there's a reason for that. Uh, I want to give special thanks to the AV team and all the people who done so much work and effort and energy into setting this up. But I think honestly, the past few years or past few months, um, people have kind of taken advantage of the comfort and, you know, that kind of, they, they desire their comfort more than their desire to worship God. And, you know, you might think, well, you know, there could be a lot of reasons why they can't attend in person. Sure, sure, I guess. But, I hate to do this, but if you like go out to eat or go to work or go to school or go socialize, <laughs> you can go to church. You can go to church. So, hey, hopefully see you next time, live in person, right? Um, you can't serve God in money. You can't serve God in idols. You can't serve God and yourself. I hope that, especially as we take a break from meeting community groups, We would seek God more than anything we've ever sought before in our lives. That we would desire the community around us to share, to see that there's nothing in their life, there's no idols in their life that's worthy of worship. To help the world realize to bend the knee and bow down to the authority of God and Jesus. And we could do this together. We could do it for the glory of God. So last thing, you know, the key verse, flee from idolatry, beloved. Job very wise man. He said to man, God said to man, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to turn away from evil is understanding. Right? To turn away from evil, to flee from idolatry. Yeah, fear of the Lord can be kind of scary. You know, he's a jealous God. He'll oblivious us at any time. <laughs> but the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I hope that as a church, we would hey, we would fear the Lord together and realize how much and how great and how worthy of worship and awesome is he. Let's pray. Lord God, as we reflect and remember what you have done for your people, that even as we have gone through many experiences and many trials, that we have face temptations, and we've chose so many other things other than you. Father God, I pray 
that you would convict our hearts. That every moment when we would desire anything else but you, allow the Spirit to help us to flee from idol worship, to flee from temptation, to flee from evil, and to turn to what is good, what is true, and that is you alone, Lord God. I pray for our church that we would continue to help each other grow, not just in our understanding or knowledge, but in our desire to honor and to glorify you, to make your name known to all the nations. God, help us do something for your glory. Help us to know that you are greater than anything we could ever think we need or want. Thank you, Lord, especially for your son Jesus, for without him we would still be lost in the desert. We would still be wandering in our sin and in our shame. Thank you for Jesus who died at the cross on our behalf, that he broke his body and bled for us, that we would be saved and we would have a hope in you for eternity. Thank you for his resurrection and the power that defeated sin and death at the grave. And so, Lord God, we give all these thanks to you. We worship and love you. And we pray all these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Eric, for bringing us the Word of God this morning. Um, you know, like, when I was in college, one of the things that I always found in my walk with the Lord was that it was when I was on break, whether that was at the end of the fall semester or even during the end of the spring semester, was when I was the most easily tempted to fall into sin. And in that passage in Job where he talks about the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and to turn away from evil is understanding. The thing that I always came back to and I found that helped the most is knowing what to turn to. Because when you're there in the midst of temptation and trying to figure out what's the best way to handle it, the thing that we turn to and the thing that we should run to is Jesus. The reason why it was so easy not to even be tempted at all during college, during the fall and the spring semester when I was working hard is because there were things that we were turning to, whether that was devoting yourself to your work. Um, in my case, that was leading worship or even um, through leading small groups. And so I just wanna let you guys know that if you are somebody who struggles in sin, whatever that might look like in your life, it seems so counterintuitive <laughs> for us to turn instead and fixate our eyes on Jesus and to run to his word or to run to brothers and sisters in Christ or even to focus on whatever way God is calling you to share the gospel with those around you. Would you stand with me as we respond and worship this morning?
my treasure, my great reward, and I just want to move your heart. It's all I want to do, I just want to stand in my love on you no matter how much the cost I freely give it all to you all to you
Tell me what moves you, I want to know Tell me what moves you, tell me what moves you I was singing this song and just worshiping in my own home this past week. The one truth that I've really been wrestling a lot with and one that I've continued to wrestle with in my life is this truth that you are loved. That you are loved. That God chose you even before you were formed in your mother's womb. That he loved you sent his son to pay the ultimate price on the cross for you. There's not anything that you need to do. There's not anything that you could possibly even do that could earn God's love for you. And that's a hard truth for me and my personality type to accept because it always feels like there's something that I can do, something that maybe um, I need to give up to show God that that I love him. I feel like the Lord was just telling me this week that he was just affirming that even in all the things that I'm trying to do for him and all the things that I think that I'm giving up for him, I just need to pause and understand that he already has loved us, that I am loved. Would you sing this one more time with me? I just want to move your heart That's all I want to do I just want to stand in awe And pour my love on you No matter how much the cost I freely give it all to you I just want to move your heart Get caught within your gaze Right here in your presence, God Oh, is where I want to stay Oh, just to dwell in your house Waste my hours and my days on you choosing us thank you Jesus for forming us and knowing our innermost parts cause you're a good good father oh you're a good good savior you're so so kind to us you are you serve.
good God, would you lift up a shout of praise this morning? Right, you may be seated. Well, what a joy it is to see everyone here. We're so glad uh, we're all together in corporate worship. Well, a large caravan of cars went uh, to Central Florida last weekend for the youth retreat, and some of the youth have put together a short slideshow. All right, so we're going to play it just to see what the blessing of really fellowship and being together is all about. Well, that was an incredible time of being together, and some things can't be accomplished in the church. It needs to be elsewhere. So next year, we want to we just alert you. You know, you get sometimes get these save-the-date postcards for a very big event. So next year, save the date. Memorial Day weekend, we're having an all-church retreat, and we'll have a chance to really be together, connect together as a church family. So save the date, all right? Memorial Day. More information will be coming. But Memorial Day weekend next year, our all-church retreat. Well, I just want to share that we'll continue uh, really uh, having our, um, uh, making available to everyone going deeper in God's Word on our time together after service, uh, the, the roundtable discussion groups to get deeper in today's sermon and also our Sunday school class about what church membership really means, what baptism really means. So we invite you to those classes if you uh, wish, okay? Let's pray, and yeah. let's pray for our offering this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are alive. You are alive in this world, and you are alive in those who love you. 
So we ask that this message be proclaimed, the joy of the Lord to the ends of the world. Bless this offering, use it for your glory, because all glory be to Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Let us stand, and we'll close our, uh, our worship morning, um, worship this morning with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for uh, this time of worship that we can experience you, and Lord, let we can have um, uh, intimate communion with you and with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And Lord, thank you for uh, allowing us um, to have this sweet fellowship with you. And Lord, thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you have done for us so that we can come boldly to our Heavenly Father and uh, just uh, to, to sit at your feet and, and just to listen and uh, um, enjoy the fellowship with you and to also listen to um, the words that you have spoken to us uh, through um, uh, Eric. And Lord, um, as we leave, Lord, this church building, Lord, not, not just leaving um, that fellowship, and Lord, we know that your Holy Spirit abides in us. And Lord, there are so many temptations and there are trials in our life. Yet, Lord, help us to remember your love for us. Lord, help us to continue to meditate on the length, the width, the heights, and the depth of your love. Lord, may we fill our hearts and our mind um, with our Lord Jesus Christ, that other things will be pale in compare uh, to our Lord. And Lord, motivate us to live for you. And Lord, I pray for all of us. Lord, help us to live a life that will glorify you. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated and you are dismissed after a silence prayer. <laughs>